It's the When Fishing Podcast. Applying techniques. Then I put the sea rigs on the A rig. fresh ideas. They can't all be good ones. Talking stories, <laughs> reports, all about five knots out conservation, of the probably too close. All to make you and I better fishermen. Hello, welcome to the show. Uh, it's been a, it's been a week been a week of some fishing uh some success some failure uh we'll get into it right now right after the break nope um i went uh surf fishing the last two days in the oc uh just like hour sessions each and uh uh pretty much working like right before high tide into Maybe onto the peak height. Actually, no. The first day was, uh, like, basically the hour after peak high. And then the second day was, which was today, um, was, like, the hour before up to peak high. Yes. And, uh, first day through, uh, pumpkin seed grub and then, uh, switched to gulp sandworm, uh, might have got uh a bite or two but i had some real wacky vibration feels during those bites so it might have just been some bizarre fluke wave thing with the wave um yeah uh lots of holes were uh you know we're like a week after the after that big old storm so uh sand's all churned up and got some nice holes and trenches and all that shit and it's uh it looks fishy nice uh nice contrast between like greenish clear water and then like the milkier uh water with the rips and uh looks fishy but no fish second day today uh switched after about 20 30 minutes to a cast master from the sea rig and uh uh, didn't get a bite on that either. Looked, uh, nice, nice looking water, clearish water for halibut or something like that, but no, uh, no real bait fish around either days. Um, uh, didn't see it inside or outside of the break or even miles off. Um, I have been seeing on the boat, uh, uh, scattered schools of anchovies, uh, they've been, they've been in relatively thick, uh, through the winter, uh, mostly anchovies, and then I finally found, uh, a few mackerel, uh, tight to the bottom, I didn't have my transducer, it's a long story, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I drifted off of the spot, that I was on via GPS and, uh, uh, after like a couple hundred feet, just dragging for dumb bullshit with, uh, lolligo tentacles, uh, uh, picked up a handful of mackerel, which were the first I've seen them since, I don't know, December or November or something like that. And, uh, so that was good to see. Um, Ike, she made them and, uh, uh, fucked around with bridling them and I didn't have a needle so it was kind of a clusterfuck uh learned several ways not to uh uh to bridle a mackerel uh yeah so there was all that uh yeah also on the boat trip uh it was just a little probably what like a four or five hour jaunt um around the San Pedro bite and uh uh, saw, you know, saw the anchovies around, uh, caught those mackerel, uh, went inside, uh, poking around the oil islands looking for some, uh, some critter, tiny critter fishing with, uh, like I said, using number 10 double dropper loop, uh, two ounce sinker, uh, 
number 10 hooks with lolligo tentacles on them and uh uh poked around a little bit caught a senorita uh didn't really get any bites after that and i started fucking around uh tuning a bunch of uh cheap crankbaits i got on ebay uh they swim they swim pretty well they'll, they'll work out all right and i uh uh these uh matsuo deep diving trolling crankbaits like long and skinny they say they go down to like 10 to 20 feet or something like that i don't know if i believe any of that shit but uh it gets down and it shimmies tight but uh it wasn't looking very good tuned it looks great now um i like to uh what was working for me the past couple of years was uh sticking a uh, crankbait on the bottom of my sabiki and slow trolling the sabiki for mackerel and sardines and whatnot and uh uh worked out really well because you know it uh the crankbait keeps the whole rig um subsurface and uh you get bit it and then it adds a little bit of a shimmy to the uh, sabiki rig in itself and uh you'll get bit on the crankbait and on uh on the sabiki hooks so that's a nice little thing I've been uh, using for a while, and uh, I don't really hear anybody else doing that, so thought I'd share. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you don't have to put a, a sinker on that little snap swivel. I'm sure somebody knows this shit. I'm sure a bunch of people know this shit, but, you know, hadn't heard of it before, so there you go. Um, so, oh, yeah, and then uh, to... Uh, top off the boat trip. I was gonna, um, uh, drag those dead mackerel around for halibut and then just kind of got the gut feeling that there was nothing around, uh, in the mud. No real, not much bait outside of like the scattered schools of anchovies. Um, it, there wasn't like birds working or anything like that. It wasn't super rich. So, uh, and most of the, and all those anchovy balls are at least like half mile or more offshore. The the more offshore you go, the more, the more there are to an extent. I don't know. I haven't seen more than a few miles out as of late, but, uh, yeah. So then after, uh, after I bailed on the, on the mackerel slow trolling bullshit, uh, I was like, you know what? I want to treat me and my girl to some sandwiches. Uh, so uh, I had about an hour left. I figured uh, I wanted to see if I could call my shot. I figured I could go over to this one rock, this one stone, and uh, uh, three-way troll uh, the jerkbait over it a few times. I, bet, I, I was betting on myself to... Uh, pick off like half a dozen fish and if two were legal and I'd bet two would be legal uh, then uh, I'd keep those two and uh, get the fuck out and go home and uh, that's exactly what happened um, uh, first pass got one second pass got my legal uh, I probably did about like eight passes or so and uh, last fish was a, a decent legal and uh, uh, cut the line and headed in and uh yeah, it was nice. It was a, it felt good to call my shot with that. And then I'm also trying uh trying not to spoil my own spots when I I know I know a couple spots are kicking out right now for me and uh I don't want to overpressure them. So something I'm practicing just like uh have have a bag of tricks and don't overuse the bag of tricks. So I'm gonna now that it's uh March one, I'm gonna go look around or it's past March one. Uh but not rockfish season. Hello, tummy. Uh <laughs> my featured guest today, Jeremy's tummy. Um Yeah, uh from like March to April I'll I'll start picking around for uh for a sheephead spot or more or two. Uh, and uh, look around for some whitefish spots. I've got a couple consistent whitefish spots up in like uh, marine, out of Marina del Rey and uh, what was that? 
Santa Barbara. But uh haven't really found my spots in the OC, so I'd like to I'd like to pick around and find my options and have them there for when I need it. Uh I love the grocery shop for my fish. Uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, water's been cold, I was barefoot at the beach today, and it, <laughs> my feet fucking hurt for, like, the first five minutes, and I got over it, but, uh, uh, water, on SSTs are still, like, 53 to 55, I saw them bump up a little bit on, like, way on the outside, like, past Catalina, up to, like, uh, 59, 60 for, for just, like, a day or two, I don't know if that was just some weird misreading or something like that, but, uh, it was, it was, uh, interesting. Sorry about it. Um, waiting for the mackerel to come in a little thicker and then start picking those off and using them for, uh, threshers. And then, uh, hopefully the bluefin will be not far behind. They've made passes on the uh, offshore inside uh, the last couple of years, so I'm kind of hoping that uh, that it can be on top of that when it happens again. I really want to learn how to catch and release bluefin tuna this year. I haven't even caught one in my life yet, but uh, I think it'd be super cool because I don't know what the fuck to do with a hundred pounds of bluefin meat so far i've eaten bluefin a couple of times and i haven't really liked it uh it's been a not i it i guess it hasn't been like you know hashtag fotb fresh off the boat but uh uh i would think it'd be better than than what it tasted like like yellowfin yellowfin frozen for a couple months is better than bluefin frozen for like a couple days so far from my experience uh but yeah i'd like to i'd like to hang one and keep one and you know fill my fr- fr- <laughs> fill my freezer with that and then uh and then spend the rest of the window just figuring out a program of uh catching and releasing them like safely and efficiently and all that shit kind of thinking that uh um one idea that I that I'm that I have that I don't think anybody's going to say is a good idea but I don't think it's a bad idea um uh I know that some people particularly I forgot who in particular it was a it was a well known it wasn't Lefty Cray it was somebody else some uh or was it? No. Anyways, um, I think it was Lefty Cray's buddy, whom you would certainly know if you knew fish names. Uh, he's he he's been tying. He's I think he's still alive. He's been tying. Uh, he's very old. Elderly statesman. I want to be nice. I don't want to just be like this fucking old piece of shit. Um, but uh, this well-renowned elderly statesman uh has been uh tying and using uh uh flies on circle hooks for a long time uh and uh with success and nobody wants to do it because everybody thinks that uh with artificials you have to use uh j hooks because it, you know for whatever reason the the fish needs to turn on the lure or on on the bait and, you know, the fish is going to slowly eat, presumably more slowly eat a natu- uh, uh, an organic bait than a lure and then turn away and then you, you know, real tight on it, not set the hook. Um, and, uh, but so long as the fish turns its head and so many game fish and so many predatory fish are pretty snappy in the way that they consume their food where like 
Um, you know, a tuna, from what I've seen, they do, you know, they'll, they come up, hit the bait, inhale it, whatever, and it's just a very quick motion of, like, it's kind of like a towel snap, really, where, like, they just make a, a zooming run straight at it, inhale it, and then they, you know, make just a right angle out of there. So I would think that you could get them on, um, on circle hooks, like, even on the troll, um, with, like, you know, with lures, uh, and so I've been thinking for a while that you could stick, uh, circle hooks on at least some lures. I don't know which ones you could and couldn't for sure, but I would think, um, I mean, slow trolled, you know, like slow trolled baits, like it's already like a thing for like a pitch bait to be a circle hook, to have a circle hook in it or, um, any natural, um, like slow trolled mackerel or whatever your, your bridled, um, baits that you're slow trolling, you're sticking, uh, sticking an inline circle on top of them. And, uh, and that's just standard. But then as soon as you get over to anything else, you're, you're switching to J hooks. And of course, like there are, there are people who've been on the water much longer than me who, uh, uh, continue to profess that J hooks are for artificials, but I just want to, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna test it out and I'll tell you how it goes. Um But yeah. That's another thing that uh the West Coast don't do that the East Coast do. By the way, I don't have any experience fishing hardly any experience fishing the East Coast. I just hear I've just listened to a lot of podcasts on it. I've listened to a lot of Sea Bros fishing podcasts, shout out and uh um, uh, listen to quite a bit of a uh, Millhouse fishing podcast. Shout out, that's a fly fishing one of like kind of like documenting uh the South Florida fly fishing history. A lot of like uh IGFA um members and record holders. Tell me, what are you doing? It's my turn to talk. Uh, and, uh, yeah, they talk a lot about tarpon, permit, snook, um, bonefish, some sailfish, um, that kind of stuff. Flats, fly, fly fishing. Uh, then, uh, uh, Sea Bros is big on the giant bluefin tuna, along with uh, uh, what they refer to over there as canyon fishing. It's uh, we have uh, on in SoCal we have a lot our uh, our offshore style fishing or our pelagic style fishing is is what that is essentially, where um, they have to drive like. Oh, I'll pull it up. They have to drive something like 100, 150 miles to go from uh, somewhere like uh, Cape Cod or Situate or whatever the hell and uh, um, to get to their deep, deep water, their, their canyons where the uh, continental shelf is. And uh, we only have to drive... Well, I guess it's not the continental shelf, but uh, we have our... We have canyons in uh, Southern California as, you know, like, uh, Oceanside and Dana Point, it's like two, three, four miles offshore. And then, uh, our real continental drop off is something like a hundred miles. Uh, once you get past all the Channel Islands and, uh, in the outer banks, like, uh, like Cherry and, uh, I think the 15 Fathom and, uh, uh, Cortez and all that shit. And, uh, yeah, so we get to experience pelagic fishing sometimes as close as like two, three, four miles offshore. And then, uh, normally more on those outer banks of like, you know, like past Catalina or past Clemente and in that 50 to 100 mile range or going into Mexico. 
You're so Cal, I don't need to tell you. I'm just uh, telling East Coasters. Why do I assume East Coasters are going to listen to this? Because I think this is a very universal show. And that's important to me. Uh, I've been fucking dawdling with Google Earth in my hands for the last, like, two minutes. Sorry. Uh, Yeah, 150, 120 to 150 miles they'll run for their quote-unquote canyon fishing, which uh, uh, they'll structure their... uh, Oh... They'll structure their charters or their uh, their trips to be basically overnighters of like drive all night to get there and then fish all day and then come back. Um, and we have that for like going down to like Mexico or going going over to like Cortez, I suppose. Um, stuff like that. San Nick. Uh, what the hell was I talking about? Um, I was just kind of going through. Uh, what those other podcasts are about. And I think you should listen to those. If uh, if you want to learn stuff, if you want to like get outside of your box, outside of your little 3600 tray, and turn yourself into a 3700 tray, stop being a little bitch 3600 tray, turn yourself into a whole goddamn 3700 Plano tackle bag, full of tricks, you should listen to... Uh, Sea bros, and uh, uh, and uh, and you East Coasters, listen to West Coast. Listen to listen to Casting Crank. Shout out Nick. I listened to almost all the episodes of that one. Um, very good info on there for freshwater and salt. Um, you know how to pick the brains, Nick. Uh. All right, moving on from that. Um, I wrote down cooking sand bass and cooking sea cucumbers. So <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I found a bunch of, I found a handful of sea cucumbers uh, as of late. I found two at the beach yesterday. And one was blue and one was uh, like orange brown or something like that. And I saw found another one in the stomach of a sand bass, which made me... Uh, wonder about what kind of benthic organisms I can, uh, I can imitate via, uh, purchases on eBay. And, uh, and then, uh, somebody, uh, perked up and told me that, uh, sea cucumbers are a Chinese delicacy. Uh, it's not something that I wish to try, but I had to Google it. And, uh, apparently they're, uh, uh, so they look like a little fucking brain stone thing and it's just a squishy little fucker and i don't know if it even moves on its own and uh fact check me google it somebody google it oh wait so uh yeah so they'll uh they'll like it doesn't have any flavor it's just a squishy little thing and uh you can just flavor it however you want and i don't like squishy things so I'm not going to try it, but, uh, if you have any, um, recommendations on how to cook your sea cucumbers, let us know. Um, something I do enjoy cooking though is, uh, sand bass among the many other flaky white meat fish out here, the, the white fish and the, and the rock fish and the bass, um, I've been making, uh, as of late, I've been making fish tacos, uh, like a tuna salad, except with like, uh, white, white fish meat. Um, you know, like just like the the mayo and the relish and the salt and the pepper and the Worcestershire and the Worcestershire sauce sauce. and the, yeah, that's a good, I like that. And it stays in the fridge without getting too fishy. I'm I'm always worried about saving leftover fish. I try to just eat whatever I cook, but with the fish salad, it it stays pretty good. Um. Yeah, I'm I'm I want to try some. I want to figure some new ways to cook 
fish this year, but uh, so far that that stuff has been those menu items have been uh, uh, kicking out the results for me. I went on a on my daily eBay window shopping binge that hopefully won't turn into a Jesus that won't turn into a a checkout binge but uh since there wasn't really there haven't been any sand crabs as of late and there hasn't really been any uh um bait fish inshore at the beach I've been thinking that uh maybe now would be a good time to start trying uh more different flavors of uh mini lures for the perch and all those things like perhaps some like uh orange grubs that would represent in my eyes um some uh like ghost shrimp or uh something like that and uh i found a handful that I, I i'm curious about um i found some big bite baits fat grub two inch twist tail plastics new old stock uh, apparently they're scented they look pretty good um you know, like a yellow orange which is kind of what i'm looking for with those uh uh with an imitation of ghost shrimp and then i found some uh twin tail grubs and a two inch variety i haven't really seen that before so that's cool um some Lindy What's It grubs. Those look pretty whack. They look like, um, like a little Rick and Morty alien. Uh, I bet those would be, those would be good. I could imagine those being good as long as they're, uh, they've got some action. They look very, you know, alien-like, but I don't know how much action it would actually have. Um, but yeah, so, uh, thinking about all that shit. How am I gonna how am I gonna further expand my unnecessarily large tackle collection? Well, I saw just now that the San Diego the boat got uh into some uh yellowtail. Some eighteen to twenty five pounders on their first stop on full size yo yo jigs. Full size. Full size yo yo jigs for full size kingies. Um, presumably on a full day trip, so I guess they're, they must be at the Coronados, right? No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like they're, uh, kind of looking around. They've, they've been around the Coronados looking, and they finally struck. So that's cool. Um, still haven't been over there. I've been tempted, but I need to, I need to get a... They got they got like a Coronado bracelet or some bullshit. You gotta you gotta get signed up with the Mexican government for that shit. But that'd be cool. That'd be cool to do a trip down there. Um, yeah. That's about it for this podcast. I think. I wish I had more. I'd like to get to at least thirty minutes. I was I was pushing for a, an hour, and now that I'm here, I'm like Jesus Christ. An hour? <laughs> if I had a real story, I guess I would... Like, if I had a... Uh... Uh... You know, a, a crazy report. A very, you know, detailed report. Other than just like, Yeah, you know, I looked around, found some mackerel, found a senorita, I found, a sand, found some sand bass. Like, beyond that, it would be a... You know... Uh... C was angry that day with my friends kind of kind of deal is gonna fill an hour but these this is uh 30 minutes so uh there you go uh uh that's about all i have to say about that uh you know enjoy uh the rest of your week and uh yeah sayonara <laughs>